Welcome everyone. Welcome this afternoon Goa time. Uh, today we have with us Alan Machado Prabhu. Alan Machado Prabhu, who uh, some of you, quite a few of you, may be familiar with the name at least. Alan is an engineer who has gone, who has taken a deep interest in in covering the world of history. Now I am also aware that historians don't like encroachers into their field. But uh, let me tell you, as a, as a lay reader, as a person who who uh, loves collecting books on Goa, a little bit of publishing them also, I think Alan has done a great job in terms of uh, collating information which uh, we don't have. Alan's uh, Alan has so far authored three books. Uh, to be honest, two of which I've published. Okay, uh, the first book was called Saraswati's Children. It's basically a history of the Mangalorians, which Alan wrote a long time back. He has slightly different views on it. We'll 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 talk about that sometime. Uh, his second book is called uh, Shades Within Shadows. That is again fiction set in the in the in the world of the Mangalorean Christians, uh, because as you know, the Christ the Mangalorians though though both of us don't acknowledge it. I neither the Goans nor the Mangalorians often don't acknowledge this connection that exists between these two communities. Uh, most of the Mangalorians, whether Christian or Hindu, Hindu Saraswats and and others, are from Goa. And uh, Alan actually uh, has done this fictional work called Shades Within Shadows. And his third book is called Slaves of Sultan. Slaves of Sultan. So uh, it's it's very complex. So we won't get into that now. There's a history where the Mangalorean Christians were taken into captivity. By Tipu Sultan for for a decade or so and things like that. We won't get into that today. We are focusing on Alan's upcoming work on the Goa Inquisition, which is a very hot topic for 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 very many reasons. Uh, we'll get into that later as the discussion goes by. Uh, his book is a few weeks from emerging, and uh, it's called Goa's Inquisition: Facts, Fiction, Factoids. Okay. And it's uh, it's yeah it's uh, it's it's an interesting book. Alan, we we are we are planning a series of discussions here, and this is the first. An overview, Alan. Uh, just before I start, let me just uh, tell you there's a, still another book which is under publication by Orient Black Swan. Uh, that's called uh, Rediscovering India. Uh, it's a tentative title. And uh, which uh, tries to trace Indian history from uh, out of Africa, really, or rather, history of Indians from out of Africa, and it comes up to Harappa and uh, the coming of the Indo Aryans. Uh, it, it collates, it tries to put together archaeological, linguistic. Uh, mm, Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Sorry, please carry on. Carry yeah, on. Genetic, genetic, uh, and then uh, the farming economy, the hunter-gatherer economy, all these together to try to build up a story. Okay, uh, regarding this book on the on the on Goa's Inquisition, uh, much of this information is based on original sources, which are available online to anybody interested, largely available online to anybody interested, uh, and these are. As well as in the Biblioteca National. Uh, there, is, there are also. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Sorry, Alan. Alan, sorry, we just missed a line or two of what you were saying. Uh, these resources are largely available where? Uh, in Lisbon and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro, it's at the uh, National Library. And in Lisbon, uh, the major part of it is with the archivo. And uh, some of it is available in the uh, Lisbon National Library as well. Uh, there are also a number of uh, new researchers that have come into the field uh, analyzing, and most of these are from uh, Portugal and uh, Brazil. They uh, work in Portuguese. Uh, but many of these papers are available online, and uh, I would recommend anybody who wants to make a serious study. Have a look at this. It takes a bit of time, but then you, you can with the, uh, do a bit of uh, translations and other things. 
you put in a lot of work you put in a lot of work how long have you been working on this uh, on this book possibly over 5 years 5 6 years now wow okay so tell us tell us uh, let's go from the big picture to the small picture we'll get into the details later but basically today what are your findings oh, uh, the 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 basic things that you found uh, contrary to what we believe so far about the inquisition uh, the, the fundamental thing i think is that a lot of uh, uh, perception of the uh, inquisition today is based on inadequate information and inadequate study uh, one of the fundamental reasons for this is because the uh, inquisition itself was a uh, kept its rep was a very secretive organization S something like uh, uh, you know the uh, cia and other things like that which keep their documents very secret. They don't publish them. So th these documents were kept in a place called the Secreto. Secreto. Uh, forgive me if my Portuguese pronunciations are wrong, you know, because I, I, I don't speak Portuguese. I, I, mine is only from what uh, reading I do. Uh, the other thing is there, there has been a very concerted effort by certain uh, other uh, countries as well as people uh, to create a black legend of the Inquisition. And uh, most of our reading comes from this because we are English readers. So most of this black legend is written in English. So we don't know what is written in Portuguese at all. And uh, we, don't, we, we don't know anything about the original archives. These have been made available, but they were difficult to access before. But now they are very nicely categorized and uh, anyone can just google and go into the uh, Torre de Tomb and, and get a lot of this material. It takes a lot of time to find out where you want. So I'm quite happy to, if anybody contacts me, to guide anybody where to look for it. So yeah. essentially, uh, essentially what I see is the Inquisition was a really a judicial organization. It was not uh, so something which went out to harass people and uh, uh, hound them out and uh, burn them. Uh, it was one of the three judicial organizations of the Portuguese empire outside. Whether you call it empire or not, I don't know, but it was a string of fortresses tied together uh, by some which Portugal tried to unite in some sort of a cultural and religious unity as well. Uh, one was the civil courts which dealt with civil matters. The other was the ecclesiastical courts which dealt with the offenses related to uh, the church and religion and the third was the inquisition which dealt with heresy which basically was looked at upon treason so uh, the inquisition was reported to the king it, it was a king's uh, it, it was entirely uh, uh, um, reporting to the king uh, but it drew its jurisdiction and its uh, legitimacy from the heresy laws which came from the pope so there was a dual sort of uh, authority. Right, right. Uh, Alan, I think, yeah, you have been uh, most helpful in terms of uh, putting across these facts. Uh, I, uh, you, you also have done a series of 10 small uh, write-ups, which help the reader to understand this com complex subject. Can we look at the first today? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, so the first one, basically, uh, it is about the opening up of the Inquisition, Inquisition's archives and statistics. That's a, that's the a first write-up. Uh, just to give a, 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 an overview of what's to come, we, we, we hope to continue this series of discussions. Uh, there is the second one will be on the creation of the black legend and why we believe what we believe. Okay, and the third one would be on uh, Francis Xavier's role, uh, the background of the Inquisition's arrival to Goa. Uh, the fourth one would be on the Goa Inquisitions, the Auto the Fairs list. And after that, we have another coming up on uh, Bardes and, and Aldona. In those days, the, the international boundary, so to put it, because uh, mm -hmm. the other side was, uh, you know, uh, enemy territory as far as the Portuguese were concerned. And, and uh, the people in these areas were facing a lot of pressure being on the, on the border. So how that affected them and migration and all that. Uh, I know your your ancestors themselves come from Aldona. Uh, then the fifth, the, sorry, the sixth one is the Valde Gore or the Vodilache Gore, 
which you debate and uh, after that we go into delon ephram gabriel and uh, pe jose da costa uh, some of the persons who narrated uh, stories uh, uh, versions and accounts of the inquisition which have really shaped our understanding uh, eighth is goan emigration uh, whether it was a result of what factors we discuss that okay because everyone believes it's everyone says that it's the inquisition that pushed us out but that's uh, open to discussion and then of course there's a summing up of the of the full uh, discussion as a whole i think some viewers were complaining that there was a problem with with your sound alan but that's fine so we'll go to the first i do i don't want to monopolize the discussion tell us about uh, the opening up of the inquisitions archives and statistics please you see the inquisition maintained uh, uh, were governed by a rules uh, which were called the regimento there were about uh, uh, four uh, uh, regimentos that had been drawn up and for goa there was one more which was uh, which came out around 1778 when the uh, inquisition which had been uh, abolished in 1774 uh, was resumed four years later so there was a separate uh, regimento for goa which came up at that time uh, one of the uh, fundamental things uh, uh, the uh, procedures which the inquisition had to adopt was apart from the secreto where they had to uh, keep uh, where they had to keep their records uh, in a secret where they had uh, three locks uh, with only three persons allowed to uh, visit the uh, secreto that was the inquisitors themselves then the procurator and the uh, promoter that that is the prosecuting uh, uh, attorney uh, or the, the priest who was the prosecutor and the one who was the defense lawyer. Uh, th these, uh, there were also rules how these documents were to be kept. Uh, now, the problem what happened was uh, that initially these documents were not kept uh, in a very good order so that when uh, uh, one of the inquisitors, he was not an inquisitor then, he was a promoter when he arrived, was a figuera, figuera and in 1623, he began uh, compiling a list of all the offenses, uh, of all the penitents who were there. He came up with a list of about 3,440, 3, uh, plus or minus, I don't remember clearly. Uh, and, and that document is available in, in what is called the repertorio. Uh, now, uh, Subsequently, uh, some of these documents were lost uh, because uh, they were inquisition went constantly in uh, uh, the, the buildings. There was renovation of their cells, uh, which went on till about uh, 1640 or so, 1630, 1640, uh, the building. So obviously, when construction is going on and to keep these things in a proper place was a problem. Was the shift uh, to Brazil also an issue, the shift to Brazil and all that? Uh, the shipment to Brazil came only in 1812, after 1812, maybe around 1814 or so. Uh, but what happened was when Sambaji's invasion took place, that was in 1684, all these documents were packed up in boxes and sent to Marmagawa, Marmagawa uh, fort. Uh, not all could be taken, so some were burnt so that they didn't fall in any hands at that stage itself, right in the early stage. Then these documents were brought back after the uh, uh, threat passed away uh, but then again the Maratha threat came in again in 1739 uh, and, and this is documented in the inventario that a lot of documents were lost and the inventory clearly shows this uh, disruption in the record keeping uh, the, when the inquisition was abolished in uh, 1812 uh, finally abolished in sorry, uh, in 1774, an inventory was made of all the existing uh, case files and they were created in, I think, seven boxes or so and they were about 332 uh, uh, folios. Uh, all these were packed together. The total case trials were about 13,000 and odd. They were Alan, shipped to list. Alan, yeah, just, to interrupt, just to interrupt, you know, I, 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 I don't want to miss the the wood for the trees in that sense uh, 
mm -hmm. the forest for the wood or whatever. But uh, just to tell us where this fits in, why are the statistics so important? Uh, why why is putting your finger on the statistics so important today? Well, statistics tell the story, you see, because uh, I think there's a large perception that a lot of uh, 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 people were burnt and uh, um, punished uh, ruthlessly as such. Uh, but when you look at the statistics and the details, you find that uh, what I can find is only about uh, 177 names of people who were physically burnt. Okay? So, and there were about uh, 20,000, uh, at least 20,000 penitents. Of course, someone someone might argue that, as they always say, that even one death is a, is a major issue. You know, if it was our relation, we would have felt uh, we would have felt uh, terrible about it. But 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 uh, what what I get a sense is that you're also saying that this needs to be seen in the context of of maybe say uh, you know punishments over over a couple of centuries or more, and maybe you know corporate corporal uh, uh, punishments like you know life and death sentence and all these kind of things that that uh, other secular courts were applying. Is that yes, a, exactly, and it needs to be looked in the context of those times. Uh, when you know a large number of uh, women were being burnt as witches in uh, in uh, Europe, as well as in uh, England, which uh, promoted the black legend to a large extent, uh, the number of people who were actually burnt were even more. If in in a few short years of Queen Elizabeth's and Queen Mary's time, were much more than what were burnt in 250 years of the Inquisition, Go Inquisition's time. But but the Inquisition gets all the debate. Of course, there 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 have been certain. Uh forces promoting this uh, it is it is very complex we'll go into that in a later part of the discussion it might suffice to say for now that uh, you know i i saw this video which, which uh, really struck me some years back and i keep recommending it uh, it's called it's called the 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 myth of the spanish inquisition it's a bbc video uh, uh, launched in 1994 i'll just uh, do a small screen share if possible uh, not of the video itself, but just of the of the screenshot, and it tells us about uh, you know uh, it's it's almost a rethink of all that we believe, and of course you've done you've done you've done much more serious work as far as Goa is concerned, but this video talks about uh, you know the the Inquisition at the global scale, the Spanish Inquisition, and all those kind of things, and how the rivalry between uh, between Holland, which is the Netherlands. And Spain, which was its former colonial empire, got converted into this uh, this uh, black legend. But but that's a different point altogether because here we are focusing on Goa. But I would strongly recommend anyone who's interested in further discussion to look at this video. I'll share the link here. It's called it it's called the Myth of the Spanish Inquisition, BBC, nineteen ninety four. Sorry, sorry, carry on, carry on. Uh, there, there is a fundamental difference between the uh, uh, Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition, the European Inquisitions, and a Goan Inquisition, essentially because of the location and the uh, issues that were handled. Uh, the Sp Spanish Inquisition and the Portuguese Inquisitions were targeted primarily. OK, let me not talk too much of Spanish Inquisition because I've not read too much about it. Uh, but on the Portuguese Inquisition, the largest number of people, practically about over 90 percent of them, were uh, the Christos Novos. That means the New converts, the Jews. New converts from Muslims and Jews who were converted into Christianity and their descendants. Uh, and frankly, they had nowhere else to go. Because they, on one side, you had the Atlantic. The other side, they were bounded by Spain. Uh, but some, many still managed to get away. And they were quite a powerful group financially. But in Goa, it was different. Uh, it, it, the first four decades, you, you find the largest number that were, uh, were punished or were burnt were either those related to uh, dealing with what we call kalpas the mauro that means uh, crimes related to uh, uh, islam uh, or kalpas the judaism which was the crimes related to the jews which were basically converts because the inquisition could not target uh, could not uh, uh, try uh, anyone except christians of course uh, it was extended uh, later to anyone who could who influenced and uh, uh, derailed Christians from their faith. Uh, uh, that's why about 25%, I think, uh, that were uh, totally uh, punished were non-Christians. And out of these, 
the major part of this 25 percent that's more than 80 percent came from the northern part uh, at the time when the uh, it was under considerable attack and stress under the maratha attacks northern part means outside of goa outside north the province yes, of yes. the north that is so that is so the so province of the north that is from bombay, uh, bombay to the uh, daman okay the you see uh, it was a narrow strip of about 60 miles or so you know not kilometers and uh, very narrow not 60 i think the uh, it was quite a small place uh, but in goa the, the inquisition's role was to keep converts within uh, as as uh, devoted converts or, or loyal converts or subjects of the king uh, through through the uh, religion through christianity uh, it was not meant to drive them away. Let's make that very clear. The Inquisition uh, punished uh, when somebody suffered that penalty. Uh, many of uh, them were uh, for sodomy, which was considered a crime against God. Uh, and, and most of the others were relapses. They had been given chances and went again. I'm not justifying it. I don't justify anything. I'm only trying to look at the facts and figures and try to explain them. I, I'm just trying to explain them. So, uh, so basically, you see, the, the attempt here was to keep Christians within the fold and to deter any non-Christians who were trying to uh, tempt them or by their actions uh, uh, offering some uh, means by which they could be deflected from the faith. So the Inquisition never went to the uh, never had the intention of driving people away. Uh, what what was the other thing you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, so so basically to get an idea of the bigger picture in that sense, no, uh, uh, where does it fit in to to medieval history? See, the Inquisition looks like a medieval institution because it was medieval, but how does it fit into the history of those times? Uh, I think as a, as a court, it was one of the most modern courts that were available at time. It looks like that uh, because they they had specific rules. They were very clear methods by which a trial had to be conducted, a case had to be conducted, and the Inquisition depended on, uh, the, the, their law was based on Roman law plus uh, canon law and uh, their own laws uh, based on the prevailing civil court laws. And all these were put together by very learned men. The inquisitors were learned. No, in, uh, every, any To qualify as an in, uh, inquisitor, you had to work as a deputy uh, before that. And uh, a person could become an, a deputy could become an inquisitor only after the age of 40. Uh, he had to be also a licentiate and had certain degrees. So uh, th there were a lot of things there. Plus the inquisitors, uh, the inquisition had, uh, could call in uh, what you call, uh, I think it's pronounced qualificadors uh, who, who were experts in certain aspects of theological law, of theology, and they could be called in for an opinion. So they were fully backed up. Everything was, uh, there was a notary at all times to document everything. And uh, these were read back to the inquisitor. Okay, that's that's what is in the regimento. Whether it is in actual practice, there's no way to know. But I would say that they followed that to a great extent. But then again, the other point is, uh, in India at least, a, lo a lot of uh, uh, people who, who were penitents and were prosecuted were uh, possibly illiterate. So these laws made, uh, you know, it was quite a um, daunting aspect uh, to be confronted before the mesa or the table of the inquisitors. Just to just to create at this uh, first encounter, first online discussion, just to create the setting for it. Uh, could you tell us, uh, maybe just give us hints, we'll go into it later in our later discussions. What were the surprising things you found while doing this uh, work? The unexpected uh, kind of finds. Well, one is I tried to find out whether any of my ancestors were <laughs> mentioned in the list, but I didn't find anything there. Uh, there are a few Macedos. Uh, Yola Machados, Yola Machados who, whose name used to be Macedos. Yes, yes. Uh, there are a few Prabhus, uh, but uh, then when you try to link them up to Aldona, the, the link doesn't come in. Uh, one surprising thing was that I found one name which could be a link uh, 
to my uh, wife's side, you know, uh, a gentleman called Francisco Arana, who comes from Kandoli, which is the same uh, place where my wife comes from, uh, family comes from. And uh, he was already in Canada uh, about 50 years before the uh, family history says that the uh, first uh, migration of the family came from Kandoli to Goa, uh, to Canada. And uh, he was prosecuted for sorcery. And he was already a Christian, while the family history says that they came as uh, non-Christians. Three, three brothers were not yet been converted, and what the one was converted there. So that was a bit of a surprise, because the links, are, the coincidences are too much to think that uh, separate uh, people. Another thing is, I found that in Aldona, uh, there could be a link with migrations and the Inquisition's activity there. But again, you have to find out why this inquisition was active there and the activity was there because of the Maratha aggressions uh, or the conflicts. So the Bosley was quite active there around 1712 and uh, within about those few years that are there, uh, practically more than 50% of the uh, uh, people who, who were uh, uh, penitents from Aldona came within that 12 years, you see. Uh, and Aldona contributes about uh, 1% or so of the total number that I've got. So, so these uh, are a border village and one more border village, like like TV and all these places. Yeah, yeah TV, TV goes back to 1664 uh, when a large number were, were convicted. And uh, at that time, uh, one of the Viceroy's reports does mention that a large number of people from TV had uh, immigrated also. But again, look at why. It is not because of the Inquisition as such, but it was because of the economic problems that took place. Because of the wars, you know, the uh, Gaunkaris were, were very badly affected. A lot of pressure came on them, uh, they, not only from for money and loans and taxes, but also for conscriptions. Young boys were taken away, and which means the fields were left fallow, and uh, they were put into guard duty, garrison duty, to building of the forts and construction of the uh, big defensive line from Kolwal to the Chapura River, you know. Alan, there's a lot of myth about myth and uh, uh, wrong beliefs about what we believe. Uh, for example, uh, many, many of our Mangalorean friends say, you know, uh, in today's nationalistic con context, it sounds quite good. They say, you know, we, we were Goans, but we fled. Goa because of the Inquisition. Now, this is like a short form to explain a whole lot of many things. I find it a bit hard to believe because what you're saying is that, uh, you know, the Inquisition didn't allow us to hold on to our native practices, which may be partly true. And we fled because of that. But it doesn't really make logical sense because you're saying that you had this problem with this religion. So you fled the state, then you, you fled the region, then you go to a neighboring religion, you, you continue being very devout in the same religious practices. You get the Padroado priest who were again connected with the same with the same you know uh, empire or whatever we call it, and 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 then then you continue your practices for hundreds of years. And today it's not the converts or the people who faced the Inquisition who had any problem with the Inquisition, but it seems to be people who are trying to use the 16th century history for a 21st century you know furthering of another form of injustice to to who have the biggest problem with it. Would you agree with what I'm saying? No, I don't agree with that. Uh, it is very simple, you know, you, you look at it clearly. The Inquisition targeted individuals. If people fled, it would have been individuals and their families that have fled, not, not entire communities or not a, a large number of people. Uh, the main reason was really, uh, again, what, what you say about uh, uh, they, they're continuing in, in Christianity once they get down to Canada and all that, uh, is a further thing. It was not religion that drove them away. You know, it, it is the economic problems that were drawn away. And this has not been highlighted. I don't know why. Sadly, uh, nobody has, ha I mean, uh, has not been really analyzed in a proper way to understand what really happened. But there is a Kunkni song, you know, which I, I used to try to understand. And that's, uh, I, I can't sing, but so forgive me. But it's something like, you know, who are you, Bonsle, uh, coming to uh, steal our crops? And, and that's in one of the books that you have published. If you have a look at that, you'll find it there. Uh, Which one? The, Which one? Uh, the one what with the, the uh, songs, songs book. 
Okay. I can't remember the name of hand, but uh, okay. uh, the three gentlemen had uh, uh, written it, you know. Ah, yeah, I know. Uh, you are talking about Zay Pereira and uh, Antonio. Yeah, Costa yeah, yeah. And and, okay, and the song is there. Or Dulpoz, Dulpoz, the Mandos, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All kind of new twists are given to all kinds of old songs, and <laughs> so it becomes very. Funny. So when you look in these things, you start getting a little bit of confirmation. You know clearly that he has come, and 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 the word used is to scrape our kunle, kunle. Yeah. A barrel, uh, scrape it away. So we don't have any food. That tells you clearly, you know, the, in a simple folk song that contains an oral history. The other myth, the other myth, which you yourself told me when we were talking on the phone the other day, you said that you were surprised that some people thought that auto the fair means actually a burning by fire. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> I, I don't know where people get these ideas. So that you was know, a priest. That was a priest who believed it. Can you? Can you? I mean, without yet, names or without yet, priest, e e Even there are some people who have published papers on that, yeah? and and using those same terms. I, I can produce that, which is so totally false. Why? Auto the fair is simple. It's just auto is act, the fair, act of faith. How can it be a trial by fire? The Inquisition uh, didn't. I mean, that that was. You know, and an auto with the fair was an act of faith. What it was, and this we'll talk in more detail when we come to the other talk, but it doesn't matter, a little overlap is okay here. Uh, it, it's the basic aim of the Inquisition was to reconcile people, to bring them back. And it's there in one of the sermons, they said that uh, uh, the, the uh, Dominican priest who was uh, preaching the sermon, mentioned that people come in here like lions, roaring like lions, and they go out as humble as lambs. You know? uh, so they wanted to reconcile people coming back, and only whom they could not, which was a sm very small percentage, as I said, probably about a percent or two, uh, these were ultimately said, okay, there's no hope for them, and that's it. They're dogmatists and such things. Of course, sodomists also got it. Uh, quite a few. Uh, the, I think the largest number after heretics were and uh, this thing was sodomous. So an act of faith was, was a public show of where the Inquisition was sort of showing its power and intimidating others and saying that, look, we know how to bring people back. And uh, when, when you look at the punishments again, uh, they may look quite... Uh, like if you say, you, in, I mean, a lot of people were whipped. Okay, and and this is the post that you see, which uh, somebody has converted into a hat kan hat. Uh, hat katro uh, That hat was only a whipping post. It was nothing so, more. So than yeah, on that also there is a myth. Like for all this time, like because the Konkani name for it is the hat katro kambo, which literally means like you know a hand cutting yeah. pillar. Yeah. Everyone believes that that was where hands were cut. Okay, uh, I've been uh, during my small studies in Europe. Uh, I've been to all these pillories and places like that where today they are tourist attractions. I've actually got a photo of myself posing in one where, you know, you tie yourself to the pillory if you are a petty criminal. I mean, you do, you do, not in those days. Uh, today, it's a you, tourist attraction. But, but, but they let you off then? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. My died. friends let me off without spitting on me, without spitting on me. But, but, <laughs> but you know, it's a tourist attraction. So you take photos yeah. there. In those days, it was a punishment posting for, yeah. for minor, minor offenses. Like, you know, the full town mocked you and said, like, laughed at you and maybe spat on you, maybe maybe whipped your behind or whatever. So, so sorry, carry on, carry on. Yeah. So, so whipping was one of the punishments that were there. And a uh, uh, lot of these punishments, a uh, lot, lot of these uh, things were to do with the spiritual instruction. Many of them had to go back and get uh, instructed again in the faith. Then they were, uh, you had to wear what is called the uh, habit or the costume of infamy. That is the Samara or the Samara was for the one who was condemned to be burnt. But the, most of them wore the San Benito, which was with the cross of Andrew, uh, which were kind of things. Okay, now you are on, on uh, uh, now you've come here and you are on watch. You know, don't step again and uh, stay on the true path as such. Could have been difficult but uh, for some, but uh, that was what the in intention of the Inquisition was. You know, Alan, in this uh, documentary, which I was referring to, the BBC documentary, and BBC has no intention in promoting, you know, what might seem like a Catholic worldview, because both of us also come from that background, however, however religious we may or may not be. 
you know, so the BBC documentary actually talks about the Inquisition now being seen as a judicial body, a juridical body, which was probably uh, more efficient than other juridical bodies of its time. And it was probably a preferred place for punishment because like you expected, you know, I mean, we, we may be sounding very defensive about the thing, but but I, 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 that's not my, my motive. Of course, our friend Augusto Pinto makes a, a related point here. He I don't know uh, whether we whether it's correct to compare uh, different forms of uh, injustices. But Augusto's point is that the sat sati was prevalent in those times. Uh, and, you know, just to get his argument, I, if I'm reading it right, seems to be that, uh, you know, some comparison between how many died of Sati and how many died of the Inquisition. Uh, I, I don't want for a moment to say that, uh, you know, my my injustices were better than yours or whatever. Okay, those those were medieval times and we have to go beyond them. But uh, some, some, some of our friends are trying to replicate the 16th century in the 21st, mm -hmm. but that's a different issue. Uh, how would you put this in the context of Augusto's comment? Well, I'll just put two things. One is Sati was banned by Albuquerque right in the very beginning in Goa. I have not I have not uh, uh, studied anything much more about Goa and Sati, but uh, in Bengal, uh, there was a, a statistics that were drawn up by one, uh, you know, there was that Protestant uh, Carey, Carey, uh, William Carey, William, William Carey. Carey, and uh, he commissioned, uh, I mean, oh, uh, got somebody to get some statistics and I've reproduced them in the book which are available in uh, uh, our friend uh, uh, Claudius Buchanan's uh, book itself. Uh, when we come to that uh, black legend, we'll discuss that portion. Uh, but there you, you find that uh, uh, the number of uh, satis there were quite high, you know, uh, and, and much higher than uh, in six months, the number was much more than the, uh, the people, uh, women burned, was much higher in the six months than uh, what they were in the entire 250 years. I'm inquisition. sorry. I'm sorry to sound like such a contrarian, but you know, I uh, my personal view. I, I'm not a historian. I've not studied this issue, but just from a superficial reading, it seems to be that there is a huge element of uh, of propaganda in all these campaigns. So, like you know, Sati is made out to be blacker than what it was because the Europeans used it as a tool to justify mm -hmm. their presence here, and the Inquisition was made out to be much blacker than what it was because the the Dutch have to keep scores against the Spaniards and, uh, you know, then then there are other kind of uh, uh, everyone claiming victimhood in a post-colonial situation. So so there is Hindutva, there is, you know, a certain kind of uh, Judaic uh, perspective which says that we were the victims. And, and uh, you know, of course, there, there, there are, I'm not saying this is totally untrue, but you, you know better. So carry on, carry on. No, but one thing that sort of... Uh, uh sometimes it wakes me up at night when I'm sleeping well, is, uh, you know, I just think, you see, b before our people converted, my ancestors converted, how many from my maternal line, did did anybody there really end up in a fire, in a sati fire? I just think, you know, I try to imagine a face. But but anyway, these are just things that, uh, you know, uh, this thing goes a bit I, I'm really can't comment too much because I've not studied the subject, frankly. And 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 also the surprising thing is that many of uh, what seem to be abnormal, you know, outrages today, in their day and age, could have been quite uh, quite justified and quite normal. No, like for example, slavery. Slavery, as they pointed out, was 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 legal. Of course, it was immoral, but it was legal for a long time in our history. And and I guess if I was in the 16th century, I would have thought it was the most natural thing to do. Probably, I mean. This is too much of a relativism here. Yeah, slavery, slavery went right through into uh, uh, even into the uh, it's even current today. You will you'll find slavery still being practiced today. And uh, one of the chapters I deal is with the so captives. And one of the persons specifically I deal is one was Gabriel, uh, who was uh, an Ethiopian slave who was uh, prosecuted in uh, 1595. So that, that's a chapter I have to a small chapter which are devoted to him because they are just one process. We are lucky to have get that, go, know about that case because his case file was sent to Lisbon for review. So that has survived. One question about uh, any Inquisition statistics from the Novas Conquistas, meaning the uh, outlying areas. Not, not much at all because by the time the Novas Conquistas, uh, uh, Conquistas came into the uh, go, into was incorporated into Goa, the Inquisition was practically inactive. 
and was uh, this thing. Uh, they have one or two uh, bottos or the uh, priests who had come in. Uh, priest but, means parts would become boto in Portuguese. Bot boto, boto, yeah. Or they even call them parabu, parabu in the northern part, but here they are mostly called bottos. Uh, two of them uh, were prosecuted. I think probably the first from the new conquest who were prosecuted, and I mentioned that in the book. Yes. As far as today's uh, discussion goes, Alan, coming back to the issue of statistics, now that we've laid the, the basic groundwork for you know the wider context, could, would you like to, to delve a bit deeper into the point that you were making? I'll put it out on the screen so that, uh, so that you can, uh, we can look at it and maybe talk about it. Uh, the, uh, th there are some details, I think, uh, you, that Excel sheet, is it possible to put that up? Huh. The photograph, maybe that, that will, yeah. I, I can talk on that then straight away. Uh, yeah. Okay, just a sec, give me a sec, I will get it out and uh, I'll have to stop sharing this and I will have to. Mm -hmm. While you do that, I'll just have a sip of water. Yeah, please. You need it because I assure everybody there's just water. <laughs> we'll have to check. Mm. Okay. This, this, yeah. Can you view it? Uh, can it can it be done a little bit bigger? One sec. Huh? Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, this this is the uh, inventory statistics. This this is the inventory that was compiled in 1774. Uh, which, which, what I told you earlier, that uh, seven boxes were sent, and uh, uh, 332 uh, in packs. You know, uh, files put oh, together. In packs what does packs. it say? What does it say? No uh, crates. That is seven boxes. Yeah. And then these are packs. You know, which were put together. These case files. Yeah. And uh, totally, they had about uh, just short of 14,000 uh, cases uh, right. completed plus about 2,000 odd incomplete. So uh, the total number comes to about 16,000. And this is what Bayau and uh, other Portuguese uh, writers earlier had a uh, quote. But what they have missed out is they have not made a detailed analysis of the output of the affairs, and which I have done. Uh, I, I'm sure that somebody could be able to uh, be able to take up on that work and do something better. There's another document uh, that I've sent you. So yeah. this is what is in the inventory. Now this is my calculation. Yeah, that's right. No, the uh, top one. No, no, the second one. Bottom one. Yeah, yeah. No, no, the second one. Second one. Second one. Sorry, sorry. And and this is my calculation, which which I have uh, revised and after making a, a comparison of uh, the different statistics. So you'll find that uh, I've, I've divided it into uh, periods, uh, 15th, uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And uh, the first part I've taken from Figuera, that was the Reportorio. Uh, the second I've taken from the inventory, uh, which justification I will not go into now, but you'll find that out. But you'll see the total figure I arrived at is just short of 19,000. Now there are a lot of uh, uh, quite a few nineteen thousand trials, nineteen thousand trials out of which, uh, yeah, nineteen thousand trials, uh, which is which is arrived figure I have arrived at, uh, yeah. but there will be some more because there are some more uh, uh, autos and uh, which we don't have information on, and some that we know that took place but we do not have the statistics. So how did these nineteen thousand end up, Alan? Just to get an idea. Uh, in, in various ways, uh, a large number were uh, given different punishments. We'll discuss these punishments a little later. Okay. But out of these, as I said, uh, a small percentage were uh, physically burned and uh, some were uh, had because they were either dead or beyond the reach of the Inquisition, their statues were burnt. So, so would you would you go in with this logic that say that uh, you know some people say that the number of deaths, number of burnings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, compare with the with capital punishments of a different era or with which trials of another era or with uh, you know. Some well, other... For that matter, you you can take the death penalty in USA today. In USA today, 
I don't remember offhand, but I, I have uh, quoted it in the book, uh, which is considerably higher than uh, uh, what the entire number that uh, ha occurred in uh, during this time of the uh, of the Inquisition in Goa. As I said, the intention was not to drive people away; it was to hold people back and to show that there was a little bit of a. Uh, authority there which would punish uh, indiscretion and uh, but the population base was different now between the usa and say goa for example yeah we are comparing very different times and uh, we are just taking a statistics and we're not going into the causes and the reasons which but of course goa goa covered a large area also no it wasn't just uh, just the province of goa or uh, uh, yes, Goa, to start with, the Inquisition's jurisdiction was right from Africa to Timor, you see. It's a very large area, but a, a very small population in each place. So you're right. And then the connectivity was another issue. So uh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, not, it's not very easy to uh, make uh, comparisons. And yeah. these are, yeah. I, I would say they're a bit of a loose, loose comparisons. But they give an idea. Right. Right. Yeah. Because because we still have capital punishment in many parts of the world. We still have, yes. you know, like executions yes. and whatever it is. But uh, yeah, there is a small complaint that the statistics aren't very legible. I think uh, maybe when I think when the out, book comes out, when the book comes out, you'll... Hey, that's that sales pitch, yeah. That I <laughs> that I should be doing. But no, but I think also when when this video is actually uh, is, uh, you know online, uh, if you if you stop it, if you stop it, I'm sure it would uh, you won't hmm. be able to read it. Uh, how, how I'll, I'll try. I'll try and get uh, something better. Uh, yeah. Or and, uh, if, if you could contact either Alan or me, we'll make our best to share these things. So so that yes. uh, that don't worry about. Yeah, sure. Uh, so sure. and Alan, you you were you were going to the third the, the third uh, slide which you sent me. Ah, that that's just an example of how how these uh, writings how these auto defas look. You know, the first one was for a solna in. Uh, uh, 1686. The second is for Kukuli in uh, uh, 1694, and the last one for Zouin in uh, 1699. But oh this God. is what you you would be uh, getting at as the original sources, and uh, this is what you'd have to sort of read and reread and interpret. And uh, was it hard for you to read since it's uh, from another era and different, almost different? Uh, initially, yes, but then you gradually accustomed to it, and then. You compare uh, translations, then you have Google Translate, which is not very good, because they they translate penas, which really means uh, punishment or, or penance, penance, uh, as feathers. So <laughs> it took a long time to understand what feathers were doing in this. Uh... Right. So so coming back, coming back to uh, what we were talking about, uh, the wider picture of the statistics here, I'll just uh, get yeah. focus on that because I really like uh, the way you've uh, laid out this material. See, because when we are reading it, it's it's hundreds of years away and it's so many, mm -hmm. uh, involves so many people and all, but using your engineering brain, uh, you have actually uh, kind of, you know, uh, given it to us with a lot of clarity and I couldn't be more appreciative for what you have done. Thank so you. If, you, if you would like to go through some of this, so, so your point you're making here is that the writing of the uh, history of the Goa's Inquisition involves a balancing act and an unbiased evaluation of primary archival data, not selective repetitions of earlier his, histories compiled largely from secondary sources and peppered by personal biases. Fortunately, the modern historian can easily access a large volume of recently digitized primary documents in global archives. So the point you're making is that everyone says the records have been demo, uh, destroyed and all that. That may be true for a small section, but by and large, the records are still there. And you have actually dug, dug a lot of them up, right? Yeah. Well, I've not dug them up. I mean, the, the, the a lot Online. of people have done a lot of work over there to preserve them and digitize them and put them up and make it available to us. Yeah. You see, and I'm sitting at my desk and accessing all these. Uh, and, and so any one of us who's interested with a laptop can do that. And a Wi-Fi, and five years of time, and five years of time. Ah, it depends because uh, now you should be able to do it faster because some of that work has been done by me, and uh, there, there are others also who have done it. So uh, for so you, 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 you know the, this information is available. So it is very unfair to say that uh, they were destroyed. We have lost quite a lot of documents, yes, but there is more than enough. 
to to make a, a really uh, uh, close enough to the truth a, a, an analysis and a conclusion close enough to what really happened so the second point you make is that the inquisition lasted for 252 years except for a short break of 4 years yeah uh, and the first inquisitor inquisitors arrived in goa in december 1560 okay uh, we often talk about goan history as if it's totally disconnected from global history you know as if it's uh, like you know a series of religious things in goa and uh, you know hindu versus catholic and all those kind of things but uh, why 1560 could you give us a setting uh, did it have something to do with the reformation with the challenges that catholicism was facing in europe uh, with maybe particular portuguese uh, happenings that uh, influenced our history i think uh, this portion uh, we will discuss in more detail when we come to the uh, talk on francis xavier's role or really lack of role because it, there's nothing except one uh, small two lines in a letter which was mentioned which everybody quotes but the real causes were very complex uh, there is a portuguese scholar uh, who had given a talk in uh, goa about a year back i think uh, paiva the name was was it antonio okay. i'm not sure yes. but paiva and uh, i've used uh, some of his paper plus other papers as well but the main threat was a, a, a sort of a threat which the king perceived from the ottomans and the other muslim uh, uh, empires around uh, to his trade and to his hold over goa so it was sent there uh, to counter the new christians who had come to goa and cochin so yeah, even I before even before the uh, inquisitors arrived in 1560 uh, 20 of them were sent to uh, lisbon for trial 20 but yes. only one was burned an elderly widow and the rest uh, were more or less reprieved at least we have some details of, i think about five at least details are there who were reprieved and uh, i think uh, most of them ended up in the ottoman empire later alan uh, your third point you are making is that the inquisitors which which you had said in passing but now it's falling in context because we have the background you said the inquisitors recorded the proceedings of every case and preserved them in a secure room called the secreto in accordance with the directives of the regimento that's the governing rules then inventories of all cases of all case files were made in 1623 and 1774 twice Hmm. they were preserved along with many other documents in lisbon's archivo nacional da torre de tombo hmm. antt and the biblioteca nacional de portugal bnp that's the national library any comments uh, no that that that, that uh, many of them you see most of the documents uh, they were shipped annually the inquisition reports were shipped annually and there was a lot of correspondence that kept going up and down between uh, the inquisitors in goa the uh, council the uh, chief, uh, the main head office in lisbon and also in other branches in fact to mexico and brazil as well so this correspondence has always been going on and it's a matter of finding them and uh, researching and finding them out even the ones in brazil were found only recently and fietler fietler has uh, bruno fietler has uh, uh, done quite a lot of work and they are also available online yeah professor bruno fietler yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh there's one question uh based on what alan mentioned in slaves slaves of the sultan your earlier book yeah how come Absolutely. how come despite the so called dreaded inquisition the king ceded ponda sange kepe kankon to the portuguese in exchange in exchange for protection sorry i can't in exchange for protection uh from hyder ali you know the new conquest were hardly conquest in that sense uh-huh. they, were, okay. they were they were they were given by treaty so so the point that our friend william the fact, the fact the fact is there you see where the black legend comes in <laughs> sorry but when you said dreaded inquisition obviously it was not dreaded at that time right hmm right yeah and and in fact but, you know there were, I, there were different reasons for that political reasons which are explained in slaves a little bit i don't know exactly how much but uh, i think that's a slightly different topic as such no i got yeah yeah but just as in passing you know i got caught up with this uh, debate in my young days because uh, it does impact 
it does impact not only your world view but where you position yourself and where you posit yourself and how you see the rest of the world how you see your own religion so in my young days i read the usual sources and i was very influenced by it and i thought it was the most terrible thing that happened to human kind mm -hmm. and uh, along the way uh, you know as i kept uh, reading and uh, discovering more and more it it struck me that you know even priolkar and things like that ak priolkar was was describing the inquisition based on two or three sources you know and then you dig up who are these guys what are they saying and you find that uh, 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 you know for, uh, one of them is is from the scottish high church and he has mm. negative opinions of every every faith uh, which is not his own faith he has nasty things to say about the the puri rath yatra and you know the mm. beliefs of uh, non christians and things like that so then you start wondering who are these guys and what is their stakes and then you when you dig a bit deeper i have written on it not from the point of view of history but from the point of view of literature how there has been a full kind of a series of books even novels and fictional works based on the inquisition and the bbc documentary says exactly that no it's become a part of our face like supposing if you question me too much you i'll ask you what's this is this a spanish inquisition kind of thing like you know so it's become part of our language so anyway I but, but sorry Sorry. Uh, no, th that that aspect we'll be covering in the uh, part on the black legend. Uh, I, I've given uh, something to Claudius Buchanan, who was uh, a uh, came as a you know sort of gay, bringing uh, the uh, salvation okay. to us poor Indians. Uh, Priorkar also I handled. Uh, I, I sort of analyzed there with with my these things, uh, and there was a lot of opposition also to Buchanan. because the military uh, the british army didn't like him at all at least uh, there, there's at least one book that was published which which was uh, uh, totally against his stand and so we will talk about that when we yeah. talk on the yeah, next yeah uh, yeah yeah of course and and then also you make the point that uh, the process of identifying globally available archive source archives began in mm. the 1970s Yes, that's by other scholars, of course. Many yes, of them yes. are available online today. Written in Portuguese, their fading lines tell much about the true story of Goa's Inquisition, hmm. right? And then you keep on explaining how the A A N T T uh, contains auto the fair list, hmm. and I'm from fifteen from sixteen fifty to eighteen zero one. Complete process files, correspondence, and much else. And I really uh, admire the kind of dedication you've been through. to compiling and these these the, these facts and figures you are mentioning are not available uh, off hand you have actually compiled them you have uh, you know kind of uh, data crunch them and you given it to us in a format which we can understand the context of well this this particular book is written more as a sort of a readable uh, book in uh, with some statistics to back up because it has to have some back, uh, backing but uh, i'm now we're in the process of compiling a detailed list of each and every uh, uh, name uh, that we can find on the goa inquisition which covers practically about 10000 names so it's going to take me some time i've reached about 2000 now uh, and then i want to analyze this and uh, uh, and uh, according to different categories like uh, uh, the places where they came from the the ages uh, what was the Uh, family uh, relatives as such what what were they punished for what was the punishment uh, and all these things so then we can analyze based on what what were the degree of punishments that were given so then it will all come out in the open it will be open for everybody to see in simple statistics and i think that will tell a lot of the story which has never been told so far so that i will do it, it is as a follow up on this book i will do that right right also some statistics uh... i'm being accused of speaking too much here but the point is that uh, you know i can see the screen bigger than alan can so i have to do some of the reading sorry about that uh, you you given some statistics you want to read them from your end or should i from my well end? essentially this is a very very uh, brief summary uh, one was what we just covered that uh, the number of persons investigated comes to about just short of 19000 uh, the other interesting thing that comes out from this uh, analyzing of these statistics is that the highest percentage of those who were sentenced were from underprivileged classes okay so there was a you want to put it as a caste i don't want to use the word caste as such because the inquisition uses caste for even professions and other things but those who that means here there was also a privileged class who who dominated and clearly they worked a little bit and that will come out when we discuss 
even uh, on the Wodlinger sometime later, that there was some understanding between the uh, elite classes and the ones who were uh, laborers and others. The non-Christians constitute just about 25% and, and about 88% of them from my analysis uh, uh, between uh, this period when the Maratha uh, troubles began in the north come from the northern area, which means the Inquisition, which suggests a different thing, that the Inquisition was active where there were political and military problems. In, and this comes to the role, which, which I mentioned earlier, of trying to hold the uh, Portuguese Estado de India together. You know, so they were active and they were followed up. So in other words, the military were in, in, in the vanguard and the, the inquisitors followed later to hold the people together. So this is a very clear conclusion that's emerging. And uh, I will link this up by uh, uh, putting into these political developments which are taking place. So the inquisitors were not out there to punish and drive people away, but they were there to hold people and keep them within the state. Uh, then the other surprising thing that uh, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, almost one and a half percent of the penitents were priests. You see, and Why? They, were punished. Why? Why? they were punished for various things. You see, obviously, the priests have to keep a very high standard uh, somewhere for doctrinal lapses, which uh, can happen. It can happen with the age or with intent also. Uh, somewhere for other crimes, which they should never have done, like sodomy was one of them. Then sigilism, that is... Uh, revealing confessional secrets, uh, doing some uh, lapses in how you conduct things, a few for a bit of corruption also were there. And then some of the other lapses, were, I mean, things was there was always a big rivalry between different uh, priest factions, religious and these things. So that was also there. But again, you find that in some cases, uh, Sudro priests seem to be targeted a bit, have not gone into that in too much what detail. Piece? What piece? Su Sudro, from the Sudro caste. Sudra. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like one was burnt in uh, 1736, you know, uh, Padre Constantino. Uh, is that a power thing? Is that a power thing in those days also? Like, uh, you know, you... you I, I think more. I think there was something like that. Plus, there was some, possibly some bias against uh, uh, Indian priests, possibly. So yeah. this this is for uh, more detailed scholarship. It's it's, I, I, it's it, this mine is just a passing reference, nothing more than that. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. So yeah. so, so very the, interesting. The last one is the number that see the, there I've got it. Uh, I had uh, I was able to analyze 136 out of the fast uh, in some detail, and out of that 177 were physically burnt, and uh, 154 had the effigies burnt because they were either dead, in which case the bones were exhumed and burnt, or they had uh, escaped across the border and or were not available. So, okay, here's your effigy. We burned that for you. Hmm. But but that burning was not, uh, it didn't end there. Once it was burnt, your goods were confiscated and other things. Uh, and But the so goods there were didn't civil, go civil actions also. There were civil yeah, actions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The goods didn't go to the inquisitors. It went to the state treasury. I see. And the state treasury paid the inquisitors their, their salaries and for maintenance and other things. Some things are very difficult to, to understand from a 21st century. It, it is highly complicated. It and highly complicated and a lot of it we don't know about. So uh, mine is only the first uh, sort of trying to open the door. I hope many others follow me and uh, younger field people who can study Portuguese well and uh, spend time in the archives and come out with something more detailed on different aspects. I'm that sure seems, that seems to be a dying breed. That's a, unfortunately, thanks to people like you, we have this work. Or we will <laughs> Thank have you. Work. And I hope that at least about another 100 uh, books will follow in the next uh, few years. I won't be there to read them, but I know they will come. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Thanks so Thank much you. for, for all the you work so you've done and for spending the last hour, hour and five minutes almost in a most... Oh. Uh, yeah, time flies, especially when you're talking about uh, interesting things and our audience also has been interacting with us. We are very grateful to all of them. And uh, we this is just to say that uh, we will actually be... Uh, we, we will be continuing this series. This is not, this is not the end. 
uh, we Alan has made my work very easy for me, and he has uh, put down all the points in a way which are very easy to raise questions on. I think he's he's given it to me in a spoon feeding manner. So I'm going to do my job and take it forward and discuss it. Any questions you can enter in the chat box. Uh, I think uh, there's a question from Augusto Pinto, but it seems to be a little bit uh, partial. Okay, he says, were ethnic Goans part of the Inquisition? Part of the Inquisition, the last word is Inquisition. I mean, in terms of conducting the Inquisition. Yeah, certainly, because you had uh, uh, Nayaks, the Nayaks and all the, uh, the uh, who, who were ethnic Indians, you know, uh, you had the Merinos, the... Uh, uh, no, as Inquisitors, as Inquisitors. Uh, I'm not very sure. I don't think they were much, but that that you need to analyze and have a look at uh, going to detail on who the inquisitors were. But I think the majority of them were Portuguese. Or Europeans. Uh, I don't think Europeans. It, it would have been Portuguese only. I see. Because, you know, they were, they were uh, doing the king's job more than uh, the church's job. I see. Yeah. Interesting. That's my opinion, but I, I could be wrong. It needs more study, frankly. The three most fascinating things you found in the book while doing the book. Can I leave that to you so that you read it? <laughs> no, we want you to prompt us into knowing where to look because it's 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 packed with facts. Maybe maybe I should you see be as, as as a as a one who, who has an interest in architecture as well. I found the plans of the Hodlanger and I know exactly where it stood. You know, and uh, uh, it's sometimes I, I would like to get back there and sort of spend some time there to to sort of. Uh, uh, and the plans are very clear. The plans show that Delon was wrong when he said there were 200 cells. They were not. So I have uh, analyzed that and redrawn those maps. And uh, I think they come out very clearly in the book. You know, the upper floor, the second floor and the top annex. And, and what was interesting in that is on the ground floor, most of it, practically all of it, was rented out as shops. And with the caveat that it was only to be rented out to gentios. Gentios meaning non-Christians, Gentiles, non-Christians, or as today we call Hindus. Yeah? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and the other interesting thing, which maybe we can conclude this thing was that among those shops, there was a butcher shop. So right in the in a high profile, uh, in, in a high profile cell or jail, there was a butcher shop and a number of shops around. So you want to explain the cover? Uh, well, this cover, uh, this painting is from Goya's, uh, Francisco Goya's painting. He was a Spanish painter at the time of Napoleon. And uh, of course, there the uh, dark legend of the Spanish Inquisition was there. And he here, he, he what he shows is uh, um, uh, a penitent uh, who's in a samara and a karocha. The tall dunce cap is called a karocha. And the cape that he's wearing is called a samara because on the samara, you, on, on it, you can see a little bit of fire. So which was a symbol of the samora. And he's being questioned. Uh, the, the black, uh, the green color uh, comes from uh, the inspiration comes from the tablecloth that was used uh, to cover the table of the meza. The meza was the place or the table at which mez, you know, in Konkani has now become mez, is the table at, at where these uh, uh, judgments and all were delivered. Uh, and that tablecloth is mentioned and the color of it is mentioned by the uh, Francois uh, Taverna, the French traveler who was there who had visited the uh, inquisitor in that place it was it came from england uh, as such uh, on the left side you see the cross which hung up on the wall uh, and that uh, to my knowledge is still there at the chapel of uh, saint sebastian in uh, antomi panjim yeah panjim uh, then a few statistics are there then essentially statistics? yeah a just, few just of them. A summary just summary uh, one is about uh, basically what we discussed just now. Yeah. Yeah. 
number of cases and and a number and, of and i give a short explanation on the right side of what uh, what meaning because this uh, you see some uh, the green dripping down that means the inquisitors controlled minds they attempted to control minds you see because her heresy uh, was something of the mind that was the only court that judged uh, uh, people who deviated in the mind civil courts judged actual physical problems at least civil court judged actual uh, physical sentences but here it was of the mind that was the main aspect and they tried to that was one of the reason which we can discuss later is why the edict of 1736 which everybody we don't understand it at all but when you see that they try to control people's minds with these things you're talking about language you're talking about language and not language not language no. that no. is the ban of 1684 which the inquisitors were not involved in at all we'll discuss that again that's the, the most fascinating uh, part of Allen's book where he talks about the so-called ban on conkani and things like that yeah. so again challenging all that we believe in now yeah, yeah. carry on sorry sorry but sorry, there's sorry, enough sorry. evidence for all that you know so no, you were talking about the edict of 17, what? 1736. The inquisitors okay. uh, uh, issued, I think, about 52 or something like that prescriptions on what could not be done. You know, and uh, many of them were simple things like when you cook rice, you should not put salt in it and uh, all that. So that means what what they did was basically the philosophy was in your everyday life, you'll suddenly see that you should not do this. So the inquisitor was at the back of the mind. And th th these were things that were your, your pre-conversion practices that were going on. Like uh, you don't offer beetle and such things. We can talk about that in more detail. I think uh, one of, who's that? Is it Rovina Robinson? She has written a, a paper on that. <coughs> yeah. A couple of questions uh, from William, who says, is it true that Bishop Matthias Castro and his nephew Thomas who built a Milagres church wanted the Inquisition abolished? Uh, frankly, I don't know. I don't know because uh, they, they, they were more, uh, it, it was again the conflict between um, religious and uh, uh, the uh, ecclesiastical authority and again uh, further further divided by Indian uh, Goan priests and uh, uh, native priests and uh, Europeans, you know. So I, I don't know, but uh, I think if I was in their position, probably I would also think the same thing. I would want the Inquisition because, again, the Inquisition was an institution of the king, you know, of a white power. So I would think uh, they would, but I don't have any evidence. No, I don't have. Another question. Uh, do you know how St. Francis Xavier got dragged into into Inquisition propaganda? This is a huge topic. Well, and well, well. When something, they are uh, when they are, uh, you always pick in icons to attack. So I think that could be one of the purposes. The second purpose is our uh, second reason is our ignorance to counteract it. But I think I'm give, I give a very clear uh, explanation in the book. What was the real cause of the Inquisition, and that Francis Xavier frankly had no role at all in it. Except. So uh, we, will, we will be focusing on this somewhere later on, no? yes, I think, yes. uh, in one of our future discussions yeah. online. Probably. Yes, yes, definitely. The third one, I think, uh, after the Black Legend, I, we come to Francis okay. Xavier. Okay. And uh, Augusto Pinto again, uh, didn't they need translators? Augusto is volunteering. Uh, it's very difficult to find people uh, willing, to, I mean, who can translate. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being flippant, but... Uh, hmm. He, I think the question is, uh, if they were foreigners running the Inquisition, how did they manage linguistically? Oh, the Inquisition. Yeah, they had Nayaks for that. What? One of them was the Nayaks, the Nayaks, you know, hmm. who were Indian, uh, uh, local Indians who uh, worked with the Inquisitors and uh, translated for them. Yes. Who knew Portuguese? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. For instance, the Pintos of Kandoli, they had a number of Nayaks from their family over the years. I've got a complete list of these also there in the book. Very interesting. So, so, so you may find, you may, uh, I hope I did some relations, <laughs> they may yeah. find something, villages and whichever thing. Yeah, that's true. You know, they keep popping up and sometimes you find very odd. Uh, kind of the things. interesting thing was the Nayaks, I mean, the Pintos of Kandoli were, uh, many of them over the generations were Nayaks. So Nayak the, is a title, is a title or a designation or a 
it's a designation. You, you see, earlier you had familiars who were Portuguese uh, nobility, Fidalgos. Uh, once they, they left and uh, moved out, then the Nayaks took over. And they were needed for these translations. It's mentioned in the uh, correspondence of the Inquisitor as well. Very interesting. But uh, with this, yeah, the questions won't stop. So somewhere we'll have to... Yeah. Promise to come back and uh, uh, work may, maybe if you can collect these questions somewhere, uh, I'll be happy to respond to them. Yes, but yes. but of course, this is just to say that this is the first of what we hope to be a series yeah. of discussions. So we'll be going into it section by section. Uh, don't worry about that. We'll be coming back. We'll probably announce it. This was a bit hurried uh, because we were not sure mm. when and how and whether it would go smoothly. But now that we've done it once, Alan has got a hang of uh, the platform and everything is fine. So we'll definitely come back. Thanks so much to everyone for your time. And of course, Alan, primarily for your time, your work, your interest. And of course, continually pushing me, which is like, you know, a very tough job. Breaking up Kumbhakaran, as the saying goes. So yeah, don't smile too much because the game will be up. With this, I'll wind up for today. Thank you so much again, everyone. Uh, I'll just disconnect here. But we'll be, we'll be back and we will announce it. Probably give you some Thanks. advance notice. Thanks, Sorry. Rico, for all these things. And I thank all the... People who have taken the trouble to listen in, and uh, there's been a constant stream of people popping in, popping out. So okay. it's interesting. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thank you. And then this this recording goes live, so it's it goes online, so it's there. Yeah, bye, bye. Okay, thank you.